Michelson today. Uh, Jim Michelson is from the um, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital at Harvard University, Boston. Uh, he's been there for over 30 years. He's a mathematical biologist. Uh, he has uh, interests, many diverse interests, uh, among which uh, micro X-ray uh, imaging, the micro CT imaging that we'll talk about, and also models of uh, growth, tumor growth, and clinical application thereof. So I will, I'm sure it will be a very exciting talk. Thank you. I'll give you the floor. That's very kind and exactly correct. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and uh, where is the best place to see it? I'm going to use this before. Let's see how that left and right. It works. So I'm going to talk today about our work, which is a collaborative project. I forgot to say. Mm -hmm. I forgot to acknowledge Christos. No, Christos and I are not, uh, between the Mass General, uh, a whole bunch of organizations we'll see in a minute, and Life Watch Greece and the HCMR on uh, the third and fourth dimension <coughs> in biology and medicine, which we study with this really quite new and interesting technology called micro CT. It's kind of like a CT, but it's, I should say, it's called micro CT because it's a micro focus CT. The x-ray is small, the machine weighs 6,000 pounds. The machine is not micro, <laughs> although we have a smaller machine, Christos' machine is about 1,000 pounds, and I have a 500 pound machine. And something called the Virtual Museum of Natural History, which is a joint project to share the data. This, uh, this is a joint project that's partially based here in the micro CT lab in Christos' group in the Life Watch Greece project, which is so tremendously exciting. And the micro CT lab works on the, the this is Christos' slide, the development of virtual micro CT laboratory aims at making micro CT data, exploration of natural history specimens freely available. Now, Christos, you can jump up any time. This is the micro CT machine. It's a beautiful sky scan, super high resolution machine, right 20 minutes away from here. And this is our joint project, which is what we call the Virtual Museum of Natural History. There are a relatively small number of scientists who have these machines, but there are a large number of biologists who want to see these images. And uh, for example, um, the, uh, there's only a single high resolution uh, picture, a study of mollusk shells, and we'll see why they're interesting, carried out by a wonderful scientist at, um, how do you get, turn on the light? What's the button for the light? Uh, the pointer. Yeah, the pointer, yes. Which one? For me. That one. No, I don't think so. Sorry, it's I'm one of the would it be this red one? Yeah. yeah. Ah, the red, the the red, red dot. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Thor Lang is a wonderful uh, young scientist in Malaysia, did micro CT imaging of a single genus of land snails. We've now done 200 genera, including, um, including it's a bit hard to see because I did such a good job. For example, Nautilus pompilus, we all know about nautiloids. The largest study was just carried out last year on about 20 specimens from uh, 5 centimeters to 25. We now have 10 millimeters to 28 centimeters. That study was with a clinical machine that gives millimeter resolution. Our images are with this machine that gives a micro, micron level resolution, a million times higher resolution. And the goal of this project is to um, is to share and view high resolution 3D images. So the philosophy of this project is that uh, the very few scientists who have these machines, Christos, me, the British Museum of Natural History, the American Museum of Natural History, can provide the stacks and then other scientists can receive the data and the philosophy is that uh, whoever publishes data from the knowledge agrees to be co-author with the people who gave the data, so as to motivate both sides of the story. And it hasn't escaped my notice that you are interested in 3D imaging at the next 
higher level of optical resolution. And you can see, we say it's the goal of the project is to share and view high resolution 3D data, not necessarily just x-ray <coughs> data. So we'd love to do this. And we're going to uh, also decipher linear A together, right? <laughs> See what it's maybe, I don't know what it probably says. When we finally decipher this, for Facebook, it's going to say, no parking here, your car will be towed. <laughs> Uh, the third and fourth dimension in biology, we only see the world in two dimensions. Our brain tricks us into thinking we see the world in three dimensions. Our retinas are flat. This is a human eye from the autopsy service at the Mass General. In fact, this uh, Daniel de Corpel, who's done this work, has been collecting human eyes. These are the only three-dimensional images of human eyes ever at this level of resolution. We only see in two dimensions, but our brains use the fourth dimension of time to let us think we see in the third dimension of space by, do using, uh, um, by using parallax and other natural processes. I think I have to use the mouse for this. Okay. There we go. It, it's confused because the table is white. So this is a uh, paper on the mathematics of the world. And in case you were wondering, mathematics can be very useful. Okay. There we go. So here, our eye uh, uses three, this is a three-dimensional rendering of the eye when we roll it around and we, the brain suddenly begins to make sense out of what is present in the third dimension of space. Our brain is all sorts of tools to keep from letting us gain that insight, but we need to figure out how to extract information. You can't see in three dimensions. You can have a rock, but you can't see what's inside. It requires some understanding. Uh, so we can also, let's see, we can also see, we can only see in two dimensions. How do we see the fourth dimension of time? And again, our brains use the third dimension of space to let us see the fourth dimension of time. This, maybe we'll get back to this. This is a study on the size of mollusk shells, cohorts, mercenaria, mercenaria, if you have fried clams in New England. And that is how old the clams are, and that is how big the clams are. At just like humans, clams get bigger. So, mollusks are quite extraordinary. How are we doing? So this is the Epitonium scalare, a uh, precious wintel trap from the Pacific. We don't know whether this is true from um, for this species, but a related species adds each of these little lines exactly every day. So that means if we want to get this growth chart, all we need to do is Look and see, we can see how big it was yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before, the day before. <coughs> Clams, car uh, mollusks carry their growth charts on their backs. So, it's very useful to see these things that are hidden in plain sight. Get it? In biology and medicine, Christos and I have been using this relatively new technology of micro CT to see this hidden dimension of life. As far as I'm aware, Christos has the only micro CT in Greece and the only micro CT in a marine laboratory anywhere in the 
world, so you can see why this is so exciting. The micro CT is a relatively new technology. You saw Christos's machines. These are the machines we were using at the Mass General. It's been widely used in industry for such tasks as assessing the percolation potential of petroleum bearing rocks. You've all heard of fracking. Well, this technology has made fracking possible, but imaging manufactured devices, the textures of food, uh, uh, looking at engine blades, all kinds of applications in material science, but very used in medicine except bone science. And as far as we're aware, we are the only group in the world, that is to say the Mass General Group, who's systematically exploring micro CT's potential for improving the grossing of surgical specimens. And Christos is the only group in the world that's exploring micro CT's technology in marine biology. It's a CAT scan that can just about see cells. So here is a picture of pig liver. And in the pig liver, you can just about see cells. The liver, uh, liver is made up of, of cells that are like little bricks. And, the, uh, and they're separated by, by little blood vessels that are like a radiator gland ca uh, called sinusoids. And you can just about see those little bricks. Here's a cell, you can imagine maybe a nucleus. Here's a little cell with its nucleus. You can just about see cells in Christos' machine when it has its upgrade, will definitely be able to see cells. Now this is the liver lobule. We know we, for more than 100 years, we have talked about um, how the, that the liver is organized into units called lobules. This is a section from a pig liver where the blood comes in at the edge and then filters through these lobules to the collecting duct. And that liver lobule is frequently described as something called a hexagonal prism. It's in every textbook of histology of the liver. Unfortunately, it's not actually in anyone's liver. But it's in every textbook of the liver. What is it? So we go back to basic principles of geometry. Since I'm here where Euclid was and not far from where Archimedes was, we know that, uh, uh, th that three-dimensional shapes in space that have straight lines are called polyhedra. And the most primitive of them, which Euclid knew about, which are called the platonics, uh, uh, um, uh, um, they're called the platonics because Plato thought they were ideal shapes to describe how the world is. And of those platonics, only one of them fits together without leaving holes, the cube. And then, several hundred years later, Archimedes, who was the greatest applied mathematician of all times, described the, the next more complicated uh, groups, which is a group of, of, of uh, a polyhedra called the Archimedeans. And there are actually two of the Archimedeans that fill space the tr truncated octahedron and the rhombic dodecahedron is the truncated octahedron is the rhombic dodecahedron. We actually know that Archimedes described these because another uh, Apis of Alexandria said, oh, Mr. Archimedes described, described the semi-regular polyhedra, but he didn't know what they were. It would be another 1, 1,500 years before Mr. Kepler would rediscover the uh, Archimedean polyhedra. I should say every shape, every polyhedron has a, uh, a partner in life, which is called a dual shape. We make a dual shape by putting a little line on the edge and twisting it around. And uh, one of the Archimedeans that fills space is one of these duals. That's the rhombic dodecahedron. Now, if we think about how things fit together in space, this turns out to be an active in a geometrical analysis. If you put a penny down, you can surround a penny with six other pennies. That's called the kissing number. The kissing number in two dimensions is six, but if you look in three dimensions, it's 12. Uh, if you go to the supermarket and you Look at how many oranges, touch another orange, it's 12 in space. That was actually no, uh, uh, assumed for, for
for thousands of years, but it was only about 25 years ago that it was proven mathematically. And an active area of research is the study of kissing numbers for three-dimensional shapes in higher dimensions. We won't use that today, but I rather like the idea that in the 24-dimension universe, the kissing number is 196,560. Actually, it turns out that this math is very useful for another area of uh, computer science, how you most efficiently send messages. You can think of messages as shapes in multi-dimensional space. Here we go back to our pig liver. We see the hexagonal prism. But aha, now we have some micro CT images of these lobules. And son of a gun, it's not a hexagon. What it is, is a rhombic dodecahedron. It has, we've counted these things up. They have about 12 sides. And it probably is something like a hand around a ball with the plumbing coming from a tube inside. That is all sorts of practical implications. Um, it also means that it's probably a modified blood vessel. Think of a little rubber tube that you fold over on itself. Suddenly, this becomes an area of topology. I won't talk too much about this. Let's get back to very useful uh, applications of the, of the third dimension. One is that there is an enormous need for better imaging of surgical specimens today. Throughout the world, one in three breast cancer patients go home with cancer in her. We discover that a week later when we look at the slides. The pathologist can see that the, that the cancer touches the edge. And we wonder, uh, this is what a lumpectomy specimen from a patient looks like. No obvious information on what it is. There's the cancer. This is expensive, this is stressful, and I should remove possibly, we actually know from our data that a patient whose cancer returns locally has a 22% higher chance of death. That's about 5% of patients in the United States that turns into 2,000 deaths every year that could be helped if we could find these patients rapidly. And it's a problem that occurs in many areas of surgical oncology. We came to suspect after studying the problem that maybe micro CT would be the answer to this question. And in fact, it is. This was the very first study. Many, many wonderful colleagues at the Mass General Hospital, but in my group, especially Molly Griffin and Daniel DiCorpo, have, had, have done leadership on making this. This was literally the very first patient. And there you can see the breast cancer. And there you can see the specimen. And as you go through it, bingo, it touches the edge. In fact, this patient was found by the pathologist to be margin positive a week later, but we knew it in 10 minutes. This is a really successful specimen. Everywhere we look in three dimensions, there's plenty of nice, normal tissue. This is a disaster. This patient needed a mastectomy. Her cancer touches the edge everywhere. So finding out how to visualize this information to the surgeon is also an interesting problem. How do we make 3D data visible? So this is one way. So now we have a computer, pro a computer image analytics problem. Here you're looking at a lumpectomy specimen. This is a wire that's put in the patient and it, to, to let the doctor know where the cancer is. And after you look at this for a while, you begin, the eye begins to appreciate that this is the cancer. And this flaky stuff is normal tissue. You look at it a few times, eventually it appears, and you begin to see that the cancer is touching the edge. Look at that again. Now we can do a lot in terms of improving the three-dimensionality of this information to provide it to the surgeon. There's the cancer right around here. And this is all this little filigree stuff that's not cancer. And we can see the cancer touches the edge right over. So you roll this around a few times and you begin to appreciate this. This is a different visualization. Here we've kind of pixelated it. This is a good cancer because you can see it's this 
solid area in the middle, but doesn't seem to touch the edge. Your brain slowly begins to see, ah, yes, there are little, little streams and wires and blood vessels, but the cancer is nicely inside in the middle. And so the whole computer image analytics aspect of learning how to prepare these pictures to let the surgeon and the pathologist better make sense out of what they're seeing is an important uh, task ahead. Okay. This is a CAT scan, a micro CT of human lung. No one's ever seen this. These are, this is about to be presented at a meeting where you can see with micro CT alveoli. These are little holes that have blood cells that are only 10 microns, very clearly structured. And there are all sorts of practical questions in this about helping uh, pathologists and lung surgeons know more rapidly whether it's a cancer they're looking at or just a, what we call a nodule. And we have a fairly large 3D lung project headed up by Florian Fintelman at the Mass General to uh, bring us into lung pathology. This is a CAT scan of lymph nodes. In this case, this is lymph nodes taken from the axilla of a breast cancer patient. So, and here you can see this is rolling around. Again, no one's ever had a, such a high resolution picture of the lymph. You can see the blood vessels, you can see the lymph vessels, and the lymph nodes appearing just like nice, discreet little jelly beans in space. Now, it's not really necessary. Uh, is anyone here a doctor? Uh, this is something the docs are interested in, which is um, finding lymph nodes. Whoops, wrong slide. Finding lymph nodes in a colon cancer. This is a rectal cancer. It turns out that, it, that cancer spreads first to the lymph nodes, and yet the pathologists have a lot of trouble finding those lymph nodes. It's a kind of a moronically simple problem. And here we can see this is the rectal cancer, that's the lumen of the rectum. And you're going to see the little lymph nodes. Here's one here, here's one there, here's one there. And you're going to see one up here in a minute, right there. And that one right there, big nose. Is that cancer? Probably. So this gives uh, colorectal pathologists better way of finding the first place where cancer is likely to spread. Also has some useful applications for understanding this. Uh, so we have a group studying colorectal. Here's a human heart from the autopsy service. And uh, so this, it's great to study the, thermo, the fluid dynamics of a heart, but you have to know what's the shape of a heart. So, this was a heart from a young man who passed away from another cause, who was sent in for an autopsy. And here, you, the beautiful thing about a human heart, if you have a micro CT image, is you can dissect it, and then the electronics lets you put it back together again, so we're cutting it from the side. Now we put it back together again, let's cut it down from the top. Okay, so we're a project where a human, we talked about the human eyes, we have a 3D eye project. Turns out the optics of nearsighted and this far sighted and this astigmatism are actually fairly obscure. This gives us a chance to see 3D imaging. And we're also studying some very interesting marine eyes. Maybe we'll talk about that. I think we already saw this. The, the fundamental practical use of micro CT is helpful in many tasks. We can identify in 10 minutes which breast cancer patients are margin positive, soon enough to tell the surgeon. So translating this into a practical clinical tool, it's not, you don't have to be Archimedes to do it, but there are a lot of little details. And we can identify actually a certain number of patients that the pathologist never sees to be margin positive. That's almost certainly because they don't get a microscope slide from every place in the cancer. But one slide is about one ten thousandth the volume of a cancer specimen. 
We can find lymph node specimens in a variety of cancers and so on. But it's useful in a whole bunch of other things like helping the grossing of surgical specimens. How do you help detect you know, where the cancer is? Uh, and uh, uh, assessing stents, it's used in the autopsy laboratory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This has shown that micro CT has a central role to play in the analysis of surgical specimens. And we'll be heading over to the medical school to talk with our friends over there who are very much interested in that. But what it's really useful for is studying the anatomy of marine organisms. This is a skate eye. Skates have eyes that have irises that are not little holes, but like a hand. No one knows why. So we provide high res. This a skate is like, you have skates here in the Mediterranean? So uh, no one knows why. And we provided these 3D pictures to Lydia Mathker and Rudolf Oldenborg at the Marine Biological Labs. And Rudolf was now going to do optical ray tracing to see why it would be good for a skate to have this very funny pupil. Clams. These are the mercenaria mercenaria that we talked about at the beginning. They carry their growth charts on their backs. We're going to see, we can, even though if we are imaging this creature in four dimensions, this is a lovely picture of clam I got from the internet. It turns out almost all mollusks grow by jumps. And if you want to know how big this, this mercenaria was when he was one year old, you just look at that smallest one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is a very large. Mercenaria, Mercenaria, the largest and oldest one was discovered two, several years ago. He's 108 years old at the Marine Biological Labs. And these fellows have a relative, Arctica Icelandica, which is the, the kind of clam that gets made in the clam chowder that lives at the bottom of, of the Atlantic. Those are the old, longest lived of all animals. They, the oldest of them was 400 years old. So by studying these creatures, you can study their growth. The, um, that's, how much time do I have? When do you want me to stop blabbing? I, I, I can, Another half hour? Half hour, okay. So we can now study how we grow, which is an active area of research in the lab, and let me tell you why I'm interested in that. This is one of my favorite studies. It's a study that we saw the graph of on the growth of clams. This study was uh, begun in the 1960-something. It uh, collected data over um, 17 years and then took 37 years to get published. Just came out a few years ago. Some of my papers will be coming out in 35 years, too. Collected by this wonderful scientist at the University of Rhode Island. And here you can see these very common cohort clams year by year by year by year by year. This person actually took the clams, put them on a big tray in Virginia, and every time, I think her predecessor would go on vacation, they would go back to visit the same clam and see how much he had grown in the last years. And you can see they grow bigger. It's not just clams that, were, that grow a certain way. We grow that way. We start out as one cell. We become two, four, eight, sixteen. Nine months later, you're a lovely eight-pound baby girl, and then a, a fully grown adult. Now, how do we study this? We've been uh, the mathematics that I've been interested in using for a lot of applications and stuff I won't talk about today is what we call binary biology. It's a uh, mathematical approach to look at biology as the result of many individual events. For each insulin molecule, either it's bound to cell or it hasn't. For each insulin receptor molecule, it's been bound or it hasn't. Now there are millions and millions of these events, but mathematically we can look at biology as a result an enormous number of these events. We've had many wonderful collaborators in many areas. But I'll talk about using this um, here are some binary biological phenomenon. Either a cell divides or it doesn't. Either a ligand molecule binds a cell or it doesn't. Either a cell binds one ligand molecule or it doesn't. Either a cell binds two molecules or it doesn't. Either a cancer cell spreads or it doesn't. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we've used this approach to study uh, many things. But we can look at growth the same way and say we start out as a fertilized egg. 
And we actually know that early in development, it takes about a day for human cells to divide at 17 hours by the day of crypto. So at the early embryo doubles in size if we measure size in terms of cells every day. When you're a newborn, the baby doubles in size about every year. When you're two years old, you double in size about every three years. When you're 10 years old, you double in size every seven years. We're very good data that the human beings increase in, in size and volume until at least our fourth decade, and I'm collecting data on myself that indicates that probably never ends. The question is, can we find an equation to capture this? This phenomenon that as we get older, we grow bigger and we grow slower. Now, for, for 100, it's not quite right, there's 172 years, mathematical biologists have looked for an equation that describes such growth without success. And they have funny names like the logistic equation that Mr. Prohoos published in 1830-something, the Gompertz equation, which was discovered by, uh, not by Gompertz, um, the Richards equation, the Burton Lafayette equation, the West equation. Uh, we can take a binary biological approach. Either a cell divides or it doesn't. So let's call, let's measure that probability. And this work was done by Phil Chowdrow. What do I mean by that? We know that in the early embryo, <coughs> that the embryo would double in size and cell numbers every day. Nine months later, you have a little baby girl. She's eight pounds. The next day, she doesn't weigh 16 pounds. So clearly, all of her cells weren't dividing. The question is, what is the probability? If she weighed 8.8 .8 pounds, the next day, you would assume that about 10% of her cells divided 8.08, .08, about 1% of her cells 8.08, .08, about 1 tenth of a percent. We call that the probability. We collected that data over the, we had very good data for humans and many other critters. For some reason, no one seems to have done this. And literally on the same afternoon, Phil and I took the data on that fraction of cells dividing it, we call it the growth factor. And we're fiddling with it on a log graph and a log log graph. And finally, we put it on a graph of the lo minus log of the log of the fraction of cells dividing times the log of n. Son of a gun, we get a straight line. Holy moly. With an R squared of 0 0.9134. That's pretty darn good. And what that means is, and there's no way you can do this arithmetic in your head, the probability of growth can be described by an equation that's described by two numbers both of which are less than one, A and B, and how many cells you are in. So the fraction of your cells dividing fits an equation that would suggest where your fraction of your cells dividing is A to the N to the B. You can sort of make sense out of this because when you're infinitely small, you're made of zero cells. Any number to the zero power is one. That means you start out development with 100% of your cells dividing, and then as you get bigger, you that number goes down by one and it fits this curve. And we went back and we collected data on all sorts of critters, mice, rats, cows, humans, and I know one that you really like, C. elegans right down here, and son of a gun, it fits this model very well. At last, Phil did this, Phil Chowdow is now at MIT, did this work in my lab, the long sought human the universal growth equation, the answer to how we grow where the rate at which you're growing is, I don't have to go into the details, the natural log of two divided by the cell cycle time, times how big you are in cells. Now, it's true when you're, when you, a child is born, you don't count the cells, you weigh him, but we know there are about 10 of these cells in every gram, times A to the n to the B. And when we test this equation, it fits the data really, really well with R squared for the log fit in the 0 0.95, 0 0.97, 0 0.99. It's not 100, but it had been 0 0.99 with so many 99s that, that, that it was rounded off, 0 0.97 and so on. Really great, great fit. And you can now see these curves of this universal growth equation, including C. elegans, which I'm really interested in. C. elegans is a lot smaller, but it still fits the same growth curve. Understanding why this goes bad is really important. So growth of children is our most standard um, method for seeing health. This was uh, especially studied in this wonderful study by Leonardo Mata. 
and in uh, Guatemala, where he asked the question, why is it that children, some children, do very, very badly in terms of their growth? I should explain that in the 1960s, people, we, we typically global health is assessed by measuring children, we measure their height, we measure their weight, and the United States uh, um, State Department said, oh, that's because children all over the world aren't getting enough food, and we carried out a whole bunch of randomized trials, which basically meant we sent peanut butter for children to eat, and it had no impact on their survival. And then Leonardo Mata went to Guatemala, and he said, why is it that these children aren't uh, growing? And here we have the growth child. This is one ch child. This is the normal growth curve of months of life. And what he noticed is children sort of start out growing, and then they get a chronic infection. This was uh, meningitis, you'll see diarrhea, you'll see upper respiratory tract infections, and ultimately death. And what he found is that children throughout the you know, developing world who fail to grow in height, in, in size, are not failing to grow and getting sick. It's the other way around. They get sick and they fail to grow. So understanding this mathematically is clearly really important. How much earlier this poor child died, could we have studied this failure of the growth curve and predicted way back here whether this child was on track for that sad outcome and to intervene so over the next year, we're going to study the growth of clams and the growth of babies. It's actually a wonderful nine-nation ultrasound study carried out at Oxford University, the Harvard School of Public Health, that has wonderful data on the growth of babies in utero and after birth to see if we can understand its mathematics better. So we can learn more about how we grow and how we can grow well. We can, now we could also say, okay, this is a purely curve fitting exercise. So we, we haven't said anything with this, this growth of this is C. elegans. My eyes aren't quite good enough. One of these is humans, one of these is chickens. This equation fits this growth, but it's just a curve fitting exercise. Why is it that we all grow by this funny equation? And uh, we, we address this question by looking at what we call mathematically an idealized model. That's a case where we look at biology that we know isn't true, but it's sufficiently simple in general that it could be expanded to be made specifically true. And we thought about chicken eggs. We actually know that chickens start growing in an egg. The egg is a certain constant size. Let's imagine the case where every cell in a chicken egg made an inhibitory growth factor molecule. It bound to cells and told them to stop, stop growing. When it, the embryo was really small, it wouldn't make very many of these growth factor molecules. So the concentration would be low, and you wouldn't expect that very few cells would have bound a molecule, so they'd be dividing. But as the embryo got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more cells would have bound a molecule. Call each of these molecules E. This is a cell. You can imagine how this goes up and up. More and more cells would have been bound, bound some minimum number. Now we're able to do this math because we, we, deal, we deal with this mathematically as a whole bunch of individual discrete events. And when we do that, bingo, we get mathematically the growth occurs such that the fraction of cells dividing by nothing more than the discrete allocation of molecules of the form A to the N to the B. And furthermore, all the biochemistry is down here in A. Uh, a is equal as a function of the number of receptors, the number of inhibitory growth factor molecules that each cell makes, the volume of the egg, the dissociation constant. B has all of the geometry. So if every cell makes a hint, the inhibitory growth factor molecule B is one. But if they're only made by the cells on the surface, B is two thirds, there's a whole math for that. So this suggests that it's, that may be the reason why we grow by this equation is because simply 
the discrete allocation of molecules among cells can cause an organism to grow by a curve of this type. Curiously, this discrete allocation actually can account for a lot of other things like sequential growth. Here we modeled the growth of one tissue followed by the growth of another tissue where it takes this is the second tissue where this tissue will not grow until this tissue is big enough to make a molecule that stimulates that tissue. Aha! Uh -huh. So again, nothing more than the discrete allocation of molecules. And the growth of, of uh, tissues in space. On this map, we simply, we have before in the chicken embryo, we just let every cell be the same in space. But now we said, what if we imagine that the cells and the molecules are in space? What happens? You start off with one cell, Suddenly you get arms and legs. I imagine they're arms and legs. And what if you have two kinds of, of, of cells, a green cell and a red cell, but now they're inhibiting each other. As you grow, they actually segregate out and you have two different tissues. So, and it turns out this kind of differential growth could account for many aspects of embryology. What's this got to do with cancer? After all, I work in a pathology department. Well, we looked at this idealized case in chick embryo, but here's something that's more familiar, the RAS pathway. For those of you who know, cells have this really complicated pathway of molecules that talk one to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other, and they're mutated when cancer comes up. And when you do that, we can actually make a mathematics for determining the growth characteristics of cancer. So here we modeled the growth of a population of cells, this we saw before, the growth of a, of, a, of a, let's say, the liver, and then we pull, kill one of these, pull the leg out from underneath it, and now the thing grows bigger. Kill another one, it grows bigger. This is what we actually see in cancer. Cancer can arise as one bad, quick event, but cancer frequently is the result of, of serial events. For example, in breast cancer, you get a, sort of a, a non-cancerous growth called ductal carcinoma in situ. It gets bigger, but it doesn't spread. It's really not bad. And then it's from there that you get another mutation. So here we have a mathematics from understanding how mutations lead to cancer, why some single mutations just lead to a sort of a growth, but not a cancerous growth, and then multiple mutations lead to real cancer. I think that's about it for today, and I'd be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, I think this is a bulk uh, estimation, because obviously there are cells which is like faster, I mean, not faster, but uh, the, the fraction of growing cells, yes. it's a rough bulk estimator. Correct. Because you have cells that will never divide, others that they will divide at the rate of, you know, 100% of the population and so on. Exactly. One. The second thing is that when you do that, you don't take into account that most of the, of the, of the mass that, that you are measuring is not cells. It's extracellular fluids. That's everything. It's just everything. Yeah. How, how this curves correlate with what we see by just growing single cells in vitro, either E. coli or mammalians? A yes. like, whole bunch of wonderful questions. So, you know, I, this is a 30-minute talk, so <laughs> I didn't put in every, but if you actually go to the math, we say um, that uh, the mathematics is, we solve the problem definitionally. We say that quality G is the abstract measure of growth if it was only accounted for by cell division and if the uh, density of cells, which we call S, is constant, but N ignores cell death and assumes cell size is the same. But in fact, if you go to the math, uh, those numbers are present in the um, mathematics and can be comprehended mathematically as we realize the true practicality of this. So that's something true about mathematical biology, which is you 
develop a nice equation for something, like uh, survival, and that's really great. You love the math. It's very pretty math. It's got to be right. So then you go back to actual growth data. So yes, we're really, really interested in that. And may I answer your other question, which is yes, G is a, is a statistical average measure of the fraction of cells dividing, but in truth, uh, G is a reflection of a statistical distribution of a whole bunch of individual little events. And that gives an incredible potential richness to how you can use the math to get better and better and better. So uh, as we say in, in America, you have to be able to crawl before you can fly. So we're really at the crawling stage, but we have the potential of going much from much beyond that. Can I add a point? Can I add another point? Yes, no, go ahead. So the, this, if you, I mean, you saw that sigmoid, sigmoidal yes. Yes. right? Yes, yes. So is it, is it uh, what kind of uh, equation is a function? Is, this? is it a conversion function? Is it a power function? Yeah. It's a double power. It's a, it's a strange equation, by the way. Uh, uh, you're asking really, really good queries, universal growth equation. What kind of an equation is this? Um, it's a weird equation. So you might say, if Mr. Verhoust, who wrote the first density-dependent growth equation, this is an equation that starts out exponentially and slows down, he would never have come up with this equation. Why wouldn't it be? This is what we call an a, uh, analytically insoluble equation. It's a little dirty secret among mathematicians that most equations don't actually have solutions. Although we actually have, we've discovered one that's maybe a little helpful. So what Mr. So, and, so all these other people, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Burton Alafi, Gompertz, well, it wasn't Gompertz, it was Sewell Wright, who I met at the very end of his life. He so much admired Gompertz, he thought Gompertz should have an equation named that for Richards, I haven't met Burton off in the West. All these people came up with equations that have solutions. No one would ever have come up with this equation because there is no paper and pencil solution to n equals some function of t. Now, you're saying, oh, Jim, you've driven up, you, you've drawn a line. Well, we can cheat. We have what's called a numerical solution where you say it does, it's not perfect, it's a whole bunch of little straight lines. And um, we put it into a computer and it calculates and calculates and calculates and gives us a functional uh, relationship between uh, this and that. But it's definitely a weird equation. And, and uh, 100 years ago, or even 75 years ago, before you could buy a laptop computer for $182, no one would have ever looked at this equation because it can't be graphed, it can't be drawn with old-fashioned uh, calculus. Thank you very much. So, yes. Can I add something? Since sure. you mentioned cell size, Yes. So uh, uh, an observation in the growth of organs, at least uh, in the bugs that I work in, in yes. Drosophila, yeah. is that cell size can vary quite widely. Yes. And uh, experimentalists have messed around with cell cycle. Yes. And so they've sped up cell cycle. Yes. Uh, and looked at the growth of things like wings. Yes. And they've shown that organs grow to a certain limit. Yes whether you speed up or slow down the cell cycle because there's a compensation of cell size. So you can have the same yes. wing with more smaller cells yes. or with fewer bigger cells. Uh, Could there, this model somehow help make predictions on what kind of molecules and inhibitors and what, what makes an organ constant despite the huge variation of cell sizes? So that is clearly a, we would say a really interesting and tractable, tractable expansion of the math is not is not to let cell size These remain a constant. The we have not mathematically explicitly modeled the regulation of volumetric size if cell size isn't the same, but I would suspect that that uh, behavior. It uh, might well pop out of the math. It's in other words, the math can embrace it. I would make some. I wouldn't bet my Toyota on it, 
but I think it's it would be uh, mathematically practical. Need elaboration of the model. Yeah, to actually say so. For example, you're a Drosophila person. We actually know that tetraploid Drosophila has bigger cells. Aha! We should study the growth of tetraploid uh, 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 Drosophila, and um, again, it's it's a really exciting possibility for the future. Yes. In your images, the CT images of uh, yeah. the cancer, what is the specificity of uh, X-ray uh, compute tomography yes. in, in different types of tissues? Yes. I mean, it's, it, your contrast is intrinsic uh, attenuation coefficient, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how, how different types of uh, yeah. cancer compares? We don't, the, the really good answer, first of all, the, the really good answers, we don't know. So we have, a hundred years of, let's get a, get a picture of that cancer back, a hundred years of uh, breast image, of, of radiology of cancer. And uh, so we, um, we say certain things um, that we actually don't have any science from. So what do I mean by that? For, we have uh, at least 75 years of really great breast imaging. And the breast images will say, well, the breast is principally made up of adipose tissue. The breast cancer is made up of cells from the ducts. The cells from the ducts are the, are the lobules. They're like little bricks. They're next to each other. We actually know that the uh, specific gravity of fat, of adipose, is about 0.7 whereas solid tissue is, uh, is one, closer to water, and we know the main uh, quality that inhibits uh, x-rays is the actual physical density, how, how many grams there are per cc, and there actually is a wonderful area of mathematics on, radi on the radiographic physics of mammography. So we, we, my guess here from what we keep saying and saying and saying is this is white because it absorbs more x-rays because the physical density is the same. Now one of the, one of the reasons why that's a little bit problematic, uh, the, uh, the likely, like the liver lobule, we've been saying for decades that breast cancer is dense and the breast isn't because of density difference, but in fact no one knows. So one of the really exciting things about micro CT, you have the X, you have the mammogram, and then you have a little slide, and you can't figure out where the slide came from on the mammogram. So we have a fairly active study now. We have, I don't show a picture here. We don't just have a picture of the breast specimen. We have a picture of the breast specimen, and then after we cut it up in little pieces before we put it in the slide, we re-image it, and then we get the slides. And now we're doing an exact comparison between the um, slide and uh, micro CT to see whether all these years when we've been talking about uh, the reason why you see a breast cancer on a mammogram is because of that difference. I should say that we can um, breast, uh, we, this is what we call the low hanging fruit because we know mammograms see breast cancer. Um, we know that Prostate cancers, we've taken some looks at prostate cancers and um, endometrial cancers. Those are cancers that we really would like to know how big they are and where they are, and we haven't gotten great results. So in that case, maybe there are ways of staining them to yeah, visualize if that's an active area of, of research. How can we improve the radiographic physics of looking at, at stuff like this? So. Um, Yes, you're asking a great question. I could probably blab on for an hour. It's a really active area of research. But are there uh, contrast uh, agents for ah, x-rays? There the are contrast agents. My favorite there, and that's a whole other part which Christos's lab will become a leader in. So we, uh, uh, we, the histochemistry of tissues is now 200 years old. It didn't just start, you know, we discovered uh, the first synthetic dye, mauve, in 1830, and then people said, oh, let's, slice up tissues and we'll stain it and we'll hematoxyl and eosin. It didn't just arise, it took decades and decades to work out what different color stain. We're just, the, the oldest of these machines is a decade old. We are just in the infancy of the x-ray based histochemistry of tissues. 
Now, I like to use iodine, something called Lugol solution, because iodine is a metal, so it absorbs x-rays. But it's a little atom, so it diffuses rapidly. And we get re and I think I didn't, I cheated, but I showed the liver that was stained with Lugol solution with iodine. The chemistry of Lugol solution is really interesting. It's a mixture of metallic iodine and potassium iodide. It has some kind of active histoche uh, histochemistry that's never been quite well defined. Um, so I, and for, now the breast pathologists will never ever let us stain their tissues. They want it to be sectioned, that's the way we've been doing it. But the prostate cancer pathologists, they're not in a big rush because they, if you take out a prostate and it's not gonna affect their decision. They're not in a big rush to see it. They don't want me to know whether it's margin positive. They might be more agreeable to uh, developing uh, stains uh, for those tissues. Similarly, endometrial cancer, uh, probably we could make a lot of, um, a lot of progress. And then finally, um, we, this is the very first look. No one's ever used micro CT in the path lab, but we'd like to combine micro CT with optical methods. So one thing, we're to, I didn't talk about this, but the Bruker company learned all this stuff from us and they actually built a machine, I'm going back to them in November. It's designed for the path lab and they're gonna hopefully sell it to pathologists. They, I, I would say to these companies, oh, how many machines did you sell last year? 175, they'd say. I'd say, how would you like to sell 5,775 machines next year? Because that's how many hospitals there are in the United States. <laughs> So we are working with Bruker and General Electric and Nikon to say, oh, let's take an X-ray picture. But while we're spinning it around, let's go up and down and do an optical coherence tomography picture of just the top millimeter. We can't see more than a millimeter or two in, but that's all you really do need to see in. So combining this with optical methods, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gliding on too much. There's something called a, 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 a you can uh, measure the physical characteristics by shaking the specimen and seeing how much the x-rays choice, x uh, the x-rays change. That's a really other possibility. And then something called uh, to multi-photon x-ray tomography, like your multi-photon optical stuff, where you look at really bright x-rays and really dull x-rays, because they actually get absorbed differently. I'm glad we know that was, uh, <laughs> sorry to ask the question. <laughs> yes. Any more questions? If not, we can thank Jim for this exciting talk. Thank and, you. Uh,